be public any moment now. Wait, so is this Hangout is public? Yes, the Hangout is public. Let me share something so people can figure out how to get the freebie that you're giving away. Let me paste it in. Google. All right, and for everyone watching now on YouTube, uh, welcome to the always titillating pre-show. I assure you that this pre-show will be as uh, boring and confusing as the other ones. The real, <laughs> show starts, the real show starts in about two minutes and twenty-seven seconds. Hey, Trey, let me ask you something. Are you? Do you have any other bandwidth-intensive things going on besides the hangout right now? Do you have the video open and something else like the live Twitch stream or anything? Um, yes, my son is playing uh, on this uh, Minecraft Hunger Games server. Maybe I should tell him to get off. Hey, you're, uh, pretty, you're pretty pixelated right now. Yeah. Am I? <coughs> I see. I can stop too. Okay. No, he's not just doing web stuff. That shouldn't bother. But tell Ethan to get off the Hunger Games. So there's this, there's this, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, my son plays Minecraft like a man possessed. And he, um, there's this new server. Uh, he's related to Hunger Games and stuff, right? And so uh, it's this Hunger Games server where you join, and there's like hundreds of other people in there. And then there's a countdown, and they go. And then everybody um, tries to see who could be the last one to live. And it's actually kind of cool because mm -hmm. the map is always random. And you team up with people, you have allies, and then eventually the allies turn on each other in very awkward moments. And, and then um, the, uh, uh, there's this other thing that happens where if everyone's apart, you know, they have the feast, and they put, like, diamond armor in the middle, and then everyone goes for the stuff, and there's conflict, and there's all kinds it's of crazy. stuff. crazy. Yeah. Different. Well, so when we were kids, we just used to run around and, and do that in paddocks and actually physically play with people. It was it was a wonderful time. Yeah, you would use sticks and poke out eyes and. And you were meant you to know. get physically damaged. That's how you learn how to deal with pain. <laughs> yeah, now he just gets um, digitally damaged. He's emotionally damaged. Yes. Yeah, I think it's good to scar him from a young age so he grows up <laughs> mentally tough like us, Alexa. Our but he toughness. won't be able to handle any cuts or bruises or anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, All right, so we go live in 15 seconds. And uh, this will be sort of a different format for us, but I, I like explaining everything live so everybody is shocked. All right. Oh, I'm prepared to be shocked. Right. Four seconds. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Okay, welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting and different kind of show. Um, I've got a wonderful guest here. Her name is Alexia Sinclair. And normally, you might notice that we have uh, many, many people in the Hangout. Tonight, it's just really kind of me and Alexia. Uh, we do this from time to time whenever I invite on a, a special guest. I really kind of want to, to figure out uh, everything that goes on in their mind and not have, not have too much distraction. Uh, so tonight will be a little bit different, and I can't wait for you to get to know this, this gal and get to know her work and get to know her as a person. So I'm going to have her introduce herself because I hate it when people try to, you know, categorize me or boil the essence of me down into one short little pithy statement, no matter how clever it might be. So I want Alexia to say something. You don't have to be humble or anything, Alexia. Just, just let them have it. Tell, tell the world how wonderful you are. Well, firstly, thank you so much for this, um, this, this hangout and for just having me on. I feel so privileged. Um, I am a digital artist and photographer, and um, it's really kind of hard to describe what I do by just saying I'm a photographer because um, I'm really an artist and I make all of my costumes and my sets and um, every little component that I can get my hands on. Um, and then I, the way that I bring it all together is that I capture it um, in photography. And then I often combine hundreds of layers in Photoshop. Um, and the whole, the whole process is really just taking something that I build in my imagination and then deconstructing it and then finding all those components and bringing it all back together in Photoshop. And that's sort of what I do. Good. That's 
better than I could have said, so thank you for <laughs> saving her. Um, and where are you today? I'm in Sydney, um, in my home, in my lounge room with my books and things. And uh, um, cool. yeah. I'm very close to you. I am uh, nearby here in New Zealand. I have a really pretty background, but I have to close it because it's so bright back there. I just look silhouetted like I'm in an uh, iPod commercial. But I will show people out the window. They always like to see. It's not very pretty today, I'm sorry, because it's all foggy, foggy. Um, normally, there's a giant mountain that juts out of that strip of land over there, but it's completely covered in this fog. And pretty much uh, all flights have been canceled in and out of mm -hmm. Queenstown today because of this intense fog. So we're all just kind of holed in here and waiting on the, uh, what's it focusing? It's focusing on the uh, dirty window. But anyway, <laughs> there's not much to see. Because either you're seeing uh, in-focus fog or out-of-focus fog. And either way, it looks like fog. Yeah, well, um, it's very, very sunny here in Sydney. It's been really rainy for the whole week, and so today's this beautiful day, so I decided to hang out inside. <laughs> Are you at, a same, at the same latitude as me in Sydney? Uh, I think you would be below, below us, James? Yeah, we're below. Yeah, we're below. Are we? We're similar. We're, no, you are below. You are below. So how much sunlight higher. do you get in the winter? Because it's your winter also, of course. Yeah, we get a lot of sunlight all of the time. Ah, okay. You must be pretty and, far north. Yeah, and the and the sun um, in summertime, the sun drops at sort of eight thirty in the evening, and then in mm. in um, the dead heart of winter, it's probably five thirty or something like that. Yeah, ours is dipping about that time, about five p.m. It gets pretty dark and doesn't get bright till about you know. 8.30 or 9 a.m. So we get about six oh. hours. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah, well... <laughs> like living in London or something. Well, one thing I've noticed, which I, I didn't really expect, is that the light, even in the middle of the day, the sun is so low that it's almost golden hour all, all day long. And so you get this really low angle of light that's a little bit yellow and a little bit orange. Ah. Kind of cool, actually. Yeah, we don't have that. We have this um, intense sun burning through the top of our heads <laughs> that you're always feeling and, um, and dealing with. And it's, if you get a nice cloudy day, you, you have to run outside and take photos. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Well, so I, I first came across your work many, many years ago. I don't remember how or why. I think you were featured on something like abdezito.com or... Yeah. One of these kind of design websites, and I was really, really struck by it. And uh, I was trying to get my head around what you do and trying to like reverse engineer everything that I had seen. And then I went to your website and I discovered that, you know, you kind of share everything you do in your techniques and your process. And I thought that was, it's so rare that people do that. I was really interested in the whole process of it. So, you know, you kind of just Describe what you do. Why don't you just go ahead and pop up one of your photos so people can see the end result of your imagination? Sure. So I'm I'm back to screen share. Yeah. Um. So did that work? Yes. Right. So this was a campaign that I actually did for New Zealand Opera. Um. Do you want me to talk about it? What? Yeah, go ahead and talk about this one while you have it up. Um, so New Zealand Opera approached me to produce two campaign images. So, I mean, I work as a fine art photographer primarily, um, and then every now and then some really cool campaign comes along that's commercial that I work on. But really what they're asking me to do is to produce the same sort of fine art work that I usually produce, but to do it in a commercial arena. So they asked me to do... The Marriage of Figaro, which is the next image I'm going to show you, and Macbeth. And um, the, the director for New Zealand Opera was in Sydney, um, and we caught up and had a cup of coffee, and he said, Macbeth is about, um, it's about murder, and it's, and it's quite gory. So um, I read it, and I chose these two characters, which is Lady Macbeth and the ghost of King Duncan, 
And um, and from over the ocean, we I worked with a design agency there, and I sort of storyboarded the whole thing and said. I wanted this really powerful, um, beautiful young model to be this young queen and I wanted this frail, old, noble man to play the ghost of King Duncan. And so they sort of sourced people and locations and things um, as, um, as I came up with ideas. And they wanted one to be very filled with um, flocks and a lavish scene and that's the next image. They wanted this one to feel quite contemporary. So this is what we came up with. It's great. Uh, it's really interesting. How did, you, how did you get her hair to fly up like that? Well, um, a lot of the time I, um, I work in Photoshop and I montage pieces together. So it's a big composite hairdo. And, um, and I illustrate into them. But in this instance, um, I had this Australian hair artist flown over with me and she constructs the hair on um, huge um, kind of wire um, sculptural construction she does. So basically she, will, she goes to Bunnings. I don't know if you have Bunnings. It's like a um, hardware store, super hardware store. And she buys all of this um, sort of metal wire and um, like plastic guttering that you put into the, the roof, gutters to stop the leaves. And then she um, sort of wires it all to her head with lots of bobby pins and then builds lots of pieces of um, extra hair onto that. And, and it's really this living sculpture. So she was sort of um, crying and on about 500 pain tablets for this, the weight of the <laughs> thing. And then they carried the hair over attached to her. And we shot it in under 10 minutes, this scene. So just to get past the hair and because it was a really emotional scene, um, they'd had this day to bond and um, the model felt like King Duncan was this, this man who was called Tim actually, um, was her grandpa, her yeah. grandfather and she was, and he, you know, so it was a beautiful day together and then he started whispering the moment the shoot began, why did you kill me? Why did you do this to me? And she started crying and he was crying and I was crying and it was, so we got it straight away. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so Will I keep moving? No, hold on just a second. Can you unscreen share for a second? Because I do, I want to make a quick announcement about your app ah, uh, okay. for people. Because uh, this is how we started talking about having this, this hangout together. Um, can you see your okay, Dave? I still see the I, I still see the picture too. Do you need yeah. me to do something to get rid of it? Yeah, click, click, screen, click screen share and then toggle it off. Yeah, and then we'll see your uh, Did that work? spectacled Aussie face. Yes. Okay, there we go. Now we see it. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so you have this new app. Yep. Uh, it's called Homage. And yep. I want you to talk about it in a minute, but I'll let everyone watching now on, on YouTube Live and Twit and on the Google Plus stream and Facebook and everywhere. Uh, if you go to my Google Plus stream, uh, if you leave a comment, um, Alexia will pick three random people to get a free copy of her uh, of her new app, which she will tell you about really shortly. And maybe I can put you on the spot here, Alexia, since <laughs> a lot of people uh, also watch it after the fact. They watch the recorded version. Can we give away three more copies to people who leave a, a comment uh, on my blog? Yeah, let's do it, for sure. All right, cool. Okay, so anyway, uh, we, we will show some of this app uh, in particular later. Uh, it's a beautiful app, uh, but go ahead and tell people about what is homage. Um, well, years ago, um, I did a Master of Fine Arts, and I produced a series called The Regal 12, which is what I'm kind of known for. And it's 12 different women who have ruled the world sometime or ruled their, their, their region. They're all um, princesses and um, tsarinas and they're all of noble descent. And so they're all true historical characters and um, I became quite fascinated in them and I wanted to produce historical portraits um, in a contemporary fashion and um, beauty sense. Um, so I did that and then they were very popular and so I followed them up with a series called The Royal Dozen, which is the Kings. Um, all along people kept emailing me and saying, 
when's there going to be a book, when's there going to be a book? And um, bringing out a traditional book wasn't something that particularly interested me. So when apps started sort of um, taking over the world in the last uh, couple of years, um, my partner James is um, a programmer and we decided that we would um, work together to produce an app instead of a traditional book. So it's called Homage and it holds all 24 artworks and um, it also shows um, a lot of behind the scenes videos, um, the symbolism behind the work because um, I am a traditional fine artist and I sort of write about what all of the meaning of the work is and also the historical um, profiles of each character. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, it, it does make sense. So tell me about, just the, I'm interested in apps because, you know, making apps is really, really difficult, isn't it? Let's, yeah. let's forget about the art for a second. Yeah. But talk about what it was like to make, to make an app because it's, it's really something else, isn't it? It is. Well, the thing is that we're really interested in making apps. So we, we decided we would um, commit our time to making this app and to use something that was beautiful like the work that I'd already produced. Um, and James, um, he already programmed in five different languages and then he learned that sort of language in um, uni and he hadn't done it in years. So he, he just wanted to basically sink his teeth into relearning that language um, and to have something fun to work on together because we like to work together a lot. Um, we didn't know it would turn into four months of producing something. Um, and while he was doing all of the, the agony of the programming side of things, I was doing all the little illustrations and the symbolism. And we sort of finished in the same week as each other. So, um, yeah, it was quite a journey. And it's really just the beginning of many things that are to come for us as far as apps are concerned. Yeah, well, it's great. Um, hey, hey, would you grab my... Uh iPad. I wanted to show people kind of what it looks like a little bit. Well, while he gets that to me, why don't you go ahead and uh, share uh, share another image and tell us a story? All right. So, oops. I think it might be in the uh, in the living room. Hopefully, my kids have not absconded with my iPad. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, this was the, ne the next image that I was talking about and I might just move past it and it was the marriage of Figaro that was from New Zealand Opera um, and these are both shot on location so we're, we're not um, building the scene in Photoshop, we're building the scene as a set before we shoot and then I enhance it in Photoshop but you know I'm not like dropping in beds and things into that scene as I might in another image. Um, I've just got these randomly plonked in here, so I can. Should I move on to the Regal 12 instead because it's in relation? No, to I mean, show us, show us whatever, anything you do is interesting to me. So oh, I like right. to hear your thought process. So go for it. Okay. Uh, well, this was this is another commercial image that I did for um, a, a, a fashion design school here in Sydney, and they're called White House. Um, and they just got us to do a series of fashion images that were going to be on windows and in Vogue and um, you know, billboard kind of campaign stuff and basically they wanted to, like any um, sort of um, commercial campaign that I work on, they wanted to build up students for their, for their school. So the, the, the vibe was that it had to look like Italian Vogue and that <laughs> it had to be high fashion. So um, this, is, um, this is an image that I did for a local fashion designer called Hannah McNichol um, and she was in love with Shakespeare and um, Lady Justice. So this image is um, this image was going into light boxes in windows in in um, her flagship store. Uh -huh. um, so for instance, she was shot with the um, with the sword and holding the scales as well. Um, and she had that tattoo that you can't quite see in this image painted onto her arm. I work with body paint artists a lot as well. Really like the idea of um, painting onto the skin, painting in Photoshop. Um, the idea that, um, it, that a photograph doesn't just need to be the pixels that you capture in an image, that it can be something that you just um, own and, and make into something else entirely. Um, and I photographed all of the little moths and then dropped them in in post. So. 
Um, and, and that's clouds at her feet that I shot at night and dropped in as well. Wow, now on to the Regal 12. So, Catherine the Grey, do you want me to talk about how I shot them? What do you want to know? Yeah, well, I, I know you have some behind the scenes videos that come with the app. And yeah. uh, let's show, show us one of the end results and then we'll share a video. Um, and so people can, you can talk through it, show, like show the photo, you can talk through All it. Right. And then we'll just kind of sit back while you, you watch one of your amazing time-lapse videos. Okay, well, let me find one that we... You want to see maybe Lorenzo to Medici, this one? Yeah, that's fine. Well, they're all great, but that's one of my favorites. That's favorite. your favorite? Okay. Um, he's so dreamy. He's dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, is a, this is one of the ones where I strayed away from something that's quite historically correct. Like the others are... Um, I study the costuming and then I sew the costumes that are really respectful to that period where Lorenzo de Medici was quite an ugly man and he frumped around town in this red robe with a red hat. It was very uncool. And I decided um, he was the patron of the arts, an amazing patron in Florence, and he um, commissioned artists like Botticelli and Michelangelo. And so I decided I would produce an artwork that was more of a Botticelli-esque type artwork. So it's a fantasy piece. Um, so the fashion is not accurate to um, what Lorenzo would have got around in. So he gets his little tights and his little cod piece and everything instead. Um, and he was a character that um, he went off hunting a lot in Tuscany. So this is a scene which is him at the end of a hunt and he's got his, um, I don't know if I can zoom in and you can see. Whoops, I've lost it now. Yeah, we don't see the zoom in. Oh, you don't? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, we do. Oh, you do see it. Sorry, it was just delayed. Okay, so this is a fox after the end of the hunt that's wrapped around his shoulders, and um, basically, um, unlike, hang on, I'm trying to resume it out. Unlike most of the the images in this series, um, I constructed this whole scene in the studio instead of um, comping him into it. So it was a matter of um, spending three days with my friend and going out um, and taking um, parklands apart <laughs> and stealing things and putting them in the car and hooning off and then putting them in the bathtub and filling my whole house with all of these plants. Um, and then constructing it all, which is what you get to see in the video. So will I, I'll bring up the video now. Yeah, let's see the video. What's the best way to show this, uh, Dave? Is it her just to uh, share her Vimeo screen? Yeah, she. Uh, I don't know if the audio is important, but she has headphones on, so we won't hear the audio or anything. But we'll see the video. But it'll be ah. it'll be jerky, you know. Um, well, I sure I sort share. of talk in the video, so maybe um, you can just actually maybe let me you just can, maybe you can reenact the talking part. Yeah, I have to work out what I'm saying. Just give me one second. Um, do okay. I go into Vimeon to bring up Lorenzo? Oh, is there? Where? Lorenzo. So how do I then share this? Uh, right, so just unscreen share and then click it again and pick the other one. Okay. Window. What? Okay. And then you want to pick the this one. one. Yeah. And then am I going to be able to play it? Yeah. Is that working? Yes. Do I need to make it larger? You can if you like. Make it a little larger. Or if you change the size of your window um, so that it's more 16 by 9, it'll get bigger naturally. Is the audio working? Uh, we don't. It's, working for, it's working for you because you have your headphones on, but it's not gonna. We're not, we don't hear it. It's okay. You can just talk through it when you press play. I get to hear the talking and the music as well, though. <laughs> um, okay. Well, this is me doing the the setup. 
um, putting everything in place. And then I'm in post here, um, adding bees, because I couldn't get the bees to pivot exactly where I wanted in life. <laughs> And hey, were you seeing it play? No, it's not it moving free? anymore. Oh, it's, it's not moving for you. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. Hang on a sec. Let me get out of this then. Right. Well, I was, I'm right smack bang in the middle. So um, if I bring it back to the beginning, if I slide it across, does it play for you? No, that's not going to happen. We'll try pressing play again. Maybe this one will... And then I get the music, so it's hard for so, me to hear you. Well, you can mute you can mute the video if you would like. Hey guys, I'll let me try it. Okay, I'll just right. share my screen. <laughs> um, I'll give it a I'll give it a run here. Okay. All right. Let me click on my thing here. Let me screen share over here, and I'll play I'll play the music loud. Okay, Dave. Yes. <laughs> so you can see it in all its proper glory. Here we go, everyone. Hang on. It's going to be awesome. You'll we'll be shocked the day. at everything this woman goes through. What? Sorry, it's buffering. we got a little New Zealand internet action. I was going to say that darn New Zealand Pardon? internet. Yeah. Let's go a little slow. Come on. Aww. Come on, you can unscreen share yourself if you like, Alexia. If you'd like oh, to unscreen. Well, I'm not, so I'm not the only face people have to look at in Brian's. Okay. There you go. Many of the artists that inspire me today from the Renaissance period were commissioned by Lorenzo to paint his family into history books. Ah, uh, that's Buffer. Oh. back to the States. <laughs> <laughs> sure that we put a link to the uh, to the Vimeo one so people can see it real time and watch how you watch how you did everything there. Um, yeah, because I guess that was sort of broken up into individual little scenes, and um, it's 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 nice to see the fluid version. <laughs> yeah, there's some awesome uh, time lapse in there. Have you ever thought about you know because Jeremy Cowart uh, has done things like this where he has. Uh, he does screen grabs and then speeds them up over time and puts them to music. It almost seems like that itself is its own piece of art. Definitely. I mean, we've been working on doing videos where we have a second screen set up so that it's a bit like that Dove ad where, a Dove ad where it's not, the screen's not moving. You just see the evolution as the image is being built. And I think right. that's a, nice, a nicer way to see it because otherwise you're sort of jumping around trying to follow this image. Um, and, and you never get time to just sit down and just completely edit something. So unless someone starts paying for the video content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting. I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I notice now that when I do behind the scenes stuff, and I don't, I don't do nearly anything to the degree that you do, but there's a lot of like artistic thought that goes into how do you edit it together what kind of music do you put into it? What kind of feeling do you want people to have as they watch the creation process? There's, it's very interesting. I think the, the music aspect, poor James spends days trying to find something that you can use for free and obviously credit somebody. But just um, to find music that, uh, if we just went out and, and just chose the music that we liked, then that would be fine and you had a Hollywood budget um, for your video. But 
the fact that you're working with people who are just sort of giving things away for free, that in itself is its own challenge with videos. Yes, that's true. So I'm going to have uh, Abe. Abe is my uh, wonderful intern for the summer slash winter. I'm going to have him come take my webcam and point it at uh, uh, my iPad here so people can see your app. Okay. Cool. Okay. Don't knock over my monitor there. Okay, so uh, here's her app. Yeah, you can just kind of watch that screen there. Let me click on it so it always stays here. Okay, so um, it's a really beautiful app. Uh, it has the 12 women and then the 12 men. And if you ever want to see any kind of uh, details or anything, you can just click. And uh, how do we get that little thing to come up? You got um, the zoom in the right-hand corner, top right-hand oh. of the screen. There it goes, yes. Or you can double-click as well. All right. So you can double-click and get different yeah. details everywhere. How big are these images in their original state? Uh, well, I pr I've, I've printed them at so many different sizes. Um, the, the prints that I sell, like I sell um, 10 limited edition prints, and they're um, printed at 65 uh, centimeters, which I think is 25 inches or so. Um, and then, but I've had them exhibited, um, you know, a meter and a half in size and, um, yeah, I mean, I build them as large as I possibly can and then I, I downsize from there. So, uh, another thing you could do that's cool with this app is if you click on this little key down here, it shows behind the scenes and, uh, you know, she writes all about the symbolism, sometimes there's videos. Um, and I know photographers love all this stuff. There's all this this lighting diagram that shows exactly where the lighting is and where the camera's set up. And do you do these sketches yourself? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I do all those sketches. You're so um, artistic. But, oh, so artistic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the thing is that we get so many people requesting um, just how did you light this scene and. Um, in a way, we're trying to address the the um, desire for knowledge that so many people have by um, putting it into an image. And you know, we've always been on Flickr and and written exactly what we do for a shoot. Um, it sort of just deals with the fact that people are trying to learn and 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 they're just generally interested. Um, and I think just sort of um, doing a really beautiful drawing of it also, rather than just some sort of 3D um, um, sort of look down at a scene is is an interesting way to approach it, and it's sort of um, in the style of my work. So that's why we did that. Yeah. Is this coming out any faster, by the way? Does this look better? Yeah, that's much better. Oh. I, where's my sound? And, um, and then embellishing it with all the layers of beautiful text all over it. And I love the fact that men were dressing in a far prettier way than women at that period with all the powder puffed hair and the powder puffed hair. Cool. Anyway, I, I can't sell the app any better than that for you. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I think one of the things also that's been really great about doing this, this collection of work is that um, in Australia a lot of schools study the work now in art school um, and so all these high school kids write to me and they want to do essays on the work and they say, I've chosen you for my, um, my essay this year and then they sort of send through 50 personalised questions that you're supposed to answer and nobody sort of just goes Google Alexia Sinclair. So I think Packaging it all up into a five-dollar app was um, the way to go. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny. I get those questions from high schoolers all the time. I think this is something that teachers, when they go to teaching yeah. school, this is one of the things that they learn. Like, okay, teacher, be sure to give your students an assignment to contact someone on the internet that they think is interesting <laughs> and ask them questions. I saw. I saw. Um, do you know semi-permanent? You would have been. It's a design conference yeah. down here, and I've done it in Auckland as yeah. well, um, presented there. And they, um, 
in Sydney I saw Jess, Jessica Hitch, I think her name is. She does a, um, she's a, um, a typographer. And she wrote, she did this um, thing that she put on Twitter where she said, okay, students, here's what you fucking do. <laughs> www.jessicahitch.com, you know, have a look at my website, go on there and then Google me. It's amazing. I don't remember ever contacting anybody and saying, write my essay for me. I know. Now it happens all the time. So yeah. here's an idea for you. This is something I did. It was a little snarky, but it worked. I took, I picked one random student and decided to do a full-on interview. And what I did in the beginning of the interview is, now I send this to all students because I have a little prefatory statement where I say, all future students, I answer pretty much every possible question in this interview. You guys can go edit this and cut it up and edit yourself in asking me questions. Then it will look like you are actually interviewing me. It's perfectly fine. That would give the same answer to you anyway. This is really much more efficient. I tell you what, the, my favourite question is, um, which I often get from, um, you know, when I'm doing articles, is they say, and how, how do you find the time to um, come up with your creative ideas? And it's like, well, I don't. I'm always answering your questions, you know. <laughs> the, the biggest challenge of having any success in the arts is just devoting time to actually making art. That's, that's how I experience it. Yeah. How long does it take you to kind of get into sort of a Zen piece where you can start to come up with ideas? Uh, the thing is that the ideas just never stop. So they, you, you're always trying to um, take a break from the brain that's constantly coming up with these ideas and I'm always scribbling them down in little books and hoping that I get the time to come back to them and bring it all together into a proper series. Um, and that takes time. It, it, I mean, I think when I did the Regal 12, I had the luxury of being, I was studying and I was working, but I, I honestly, people just didn't email me about things. And um, so I, I have to actually say to the whole world, my family, my friends and everybody, I'm just not available for the next three or four weeks while I actually complete, I need deadlines like exhibition deadlines, um, uh -huh. things like that where I just say like I start to panic and then I just say to everybody leave me alone I have to produce these things but it's, it's really interesting because I think that being an artist that has any um, money coming in which is what it takes to produce work um, you, you are running a 9 to 5 business and so you, you have to be answering emails all day and you have to be current and you have to be in articles so um, you have to devote t time to them. And if you don't, you're a fool because it's all free advertising, you know. So yeah. it's the balance. It's always that horrible balance. Yeah. So I have a very incisive question for you. Are you ready? Yes. Uh, so, like, do you ever have an idea? Like, oh, this is really this is an interesting idea. And then you start executing on the idea. And then you're, you know neck deep into the middle of it and you're like, oh, this is just not going to work out. Uh, what goes through your mind at that point? And do you like try to go back to the original vision and go, oh, okay, right. it will work out great. I just have to keep slogging through. Or is everything just as effortless as your videos make them appear? <laughs> um, I shot Cleopatra with three different models. Um, at different oh. times over two different years. Um, so I think that if you don't, the thing with portraiture is if, if, um, if that model just doesn't turn it on for you, um, you're not going to get the image that you're after and it doesn't matter how much you, like sometimes, I mean I direct people and I really um, nurture them at a shoot and try to get the most out of them that I can, but sometimes people just can't, give you the essence of something and, and that's what a great portrait takes. So sometimes I just have to dump something and not, you know, and rethink it. And um, even this week I was building a prop and I got to the very end and it was, it was five days working on this prop and, and I looked at James and I said, I don't think this is going to work. And, and the thing is I'll take it to the shoot and I'll have many, many different options at that shoot and sometimes 
you might put a week into building something and you don't even think twice about using it at the shoot because it's just not going to work. So I just don't think you should, um, like I don't do a shoot and then think I'll just fix it in post. You know, I never go in and, and take, um, well, we call it polishing a turd. You know, I don't go, <laughs> I don't go in and I, and I say I'll just keep working this till it works. I just decide to scrap it and reshoot. You have to be brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do uh, you have some more stuff to share with us, I hope? Let's sure. pop up some more full screen images and talk through them. All right. I assume so. that the whole audience is just like me and they could just look at your stuff and hear you talk all day. We're all, I know you find it quite uh, banal, but uh, the rest of the world is always fascinated by the uh, Aussie accent. <laughs> I don't even think I have a very thick Aussie accent, unfortunately, for you all. Well, maybe that means well, you when you're outside of uh, Australia, all Aussie accents are of equal thickness. Is that right? No, that's because yeah, you haven't they all, left. They all sound alike. No, no. If if you leave Sydney or Melbourne and then you go inland anywhere, um, it becomes very thick. And sometimes I have trouble understanding people too. It's, Australia, yeah. it's pretty remote, you know. Um, I'll I'll go back to the beginning of the regal. Um, so, uh, will I just like sort of move through them? Do you want to know? Yeah, please. Will I talk about anything? Do you want to ask me a question? Oh yeah. Well, um, let's see. Show us uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the male ones that you're okay. most happy with, um, okay. other than Lorenzo. Other than Lorenzo. Uh, oh, um, this is. Uh, Pope Alexander, and he was um, a wicked, wicked man. Can you can you say you've got it? Yeah? Yes. Um, basically, um, all Renaissance debauched popes are named um, after um, this pope because the Borgia popes were he, the, the most wicked of all. Um, I'm not a very religious person, but I find a lot of interesting um, stories that come out of religious content. So he was renowned for having an orgy at the Vatican, and his daughter was Lucretia Borgia, so um, the famous poisoner. So every time um, the family had somebody they wanted to get rid of, they would have these um, these lunches and dinners, and um, she would have this little ring where she would. Um, have poison in it and then she would pour it into their food or she, they had this famous Borgia goblet and it had a little trap door in the bottom and they put poison in it. So my Pope is holding the, the poison chalice there and it's got the little poisony fumes coming out of it. I don't know if you can see, they're a little bit green, that's to indicate that it's the evil stuff. And um, at this orgy it was called the Ballet of the Chestnuts and um, they basically had these courtesans come and all of their um, their guests, and they scattered these chestnuts throughout the Vatican um, in in this big room where they're having this um, banquet. And then the courtesans had to crawl all over the ground, and the men had to crawl all over capturing them. And then it turned into this huge orgy. So anyway, I thought this was this fantastic story. So you see the the chestnuts at the base on the table there, and yeah. Um, yeah, and so sort of everything in this has a symbolic meaning and there's women sort of flying off in the background. You probably, you have to buy the app and then you can see the detail. <laughs> um, and this is actually, um, pardon? Uh, do these uh, cause a lot of uh, controversy? I know whenever, like I can even just put up an innocent image of a, of a, of a pretty part of a cathedral and then, you know, then everyone comes out with some hot religious opinion I think maybe because Australia is not particularly interested in religion, um, there's a high proportion of atheists and we're not, you know, even I think we let atheists let religious people be religious and religious people let atheists be religious, we're not very um, hung up on it. So I actually haven't copped a single comment about religion. I do get a little bit about nudity um, mm. every now and then because I, I also find the human body to be a beautiful thing and I've never had a hang-up about um, breasts being in my work or, or anything like that. Some people do. 
But people never actually email me directly and say, how dare you put breasts in your work, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, this, this character, um, he is Donald Belisario, the TV producer that you have in the States. <gasps> And he yeah. has a place here in Sydney, and um, and I went to a uh, New Year's Eve party there because he's got the best view of Sydney Harbour. And I don't know if you know, but Sydney Harbour at in New Year's Eve, it's, it is the best fireworks in the world. There's five sets of fireworks throughout the whole area. And he came up and he had this amazing hooked nose. And the original character had this amazing hooked nose. And I said, you've got to be my Pope. And he loved it. He was just sitting there fondling his chestnuts, and and that's <laughs> that one. So to speak, cool. Hey, um, hey, will you go back to that one image? It's my favorite of the original Royal Twelve. It's uh, the women it's the profile image. It's the one that I had up on my uh, iPad when we first got it. Oh, who did you have up? Uh, um, oh, did you have right Marie Antoinette? Tonight. If that's bad of me. I should know exactly who these women are. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. Her. Is it Marie She's the one. Yeah. Yes. Is that, so, is that supposed to be inside Versailles? It's not Versailles. It's, the, it's uh, called the Palace of the Dukes. It's in Dijon in France. And um, mm. I had won a traveling scholarship for my honors year. And um, so I packed up a a Bronica and um, 120 rolls of medium format film and I went off to Europe for five months and um, just travelled around shooting these amazing backdrops. Um, and that's kind of where the Regal 12 was born, where I came back with these incredible scenes and thought, I don't want to shoot just landscapes or, not that there's just anything wrong with just doing a landscape or an architectural scene, but I wanted them to be um, very fine art based. So I use them as my sort of, I call them my backgrounds for, for these scenes. And so basically I was in Dijon, I went into this palace to see an exhibition which was um, by a photographer who shot Paris from the perspective of sculptures. So he would get up behind this sculpture and there'd be a bit of a nose looking out into this park and then a bit of a, you know, hair, which I thought was a really interesting concept. And I was walking around this exhibition um, and normally um, if you go into a, a palace, they take your camera and your tripod and everything off you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But because it was just an exhibition, I walked in with my camera. And then I saw this sort of um, shard of light off in the corner and I went over to it and this room was beyond that shard of light. And um, no one was in there because it was blocked off to the public. So I put my camera on the ground and did a long exposure. And then the mirror yeah. in the camera went donk. And then the security came and grabbed me. And that was my one frame of that scene. And that's... Awesome. Yeah, that's the background. And what's kind of cool is that it has, you know, Marie Antoinette um, had her head chopped off. Um, she was... Um, the revolutionaries took over and all of the characters of the revolution are inside that painting that you see in there, which mm. I really like. And I sort of moved them all around. I'll try to zoom in there. Uh, you have Napoleon here and he was actually behind her in the painting so I've popped him in there and Liberty. So... You know, she was famous for um, having said, let them eat cake, which of course she didn't say, but it summarised everything that she felt about the general public and her ignorance. Um, so she's sweeping across the sofa, having her lump of cake, and um, she was shot on that sofa um, in an antique centre in Sydney, and then mm. I comped that into the scene. And all so the pearls are all individually put on too, and then I illustrated the hairdo. Ah, I see. Well, so yeah. actually I was surprised to find out you did that, that background with film. Do you have a lot of uh, mixed uh, film plus digital in your work? Yeah, I mean, I try not to, um, but I, I shot on film until um, 2007. So mm. I, I have a lot of, um, I have 2,000 um, medium format back, um, you know, shots that I'm trying to scan at the moment, which just takes a lifetime. 
And it just seems kind of silly to be trying to, um, to, to shoot anything on film if I'm going to be a digital artist. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and they're also the nowhere near as good quality as my Hasselblad shoots now. So it's really hard to, um, I, have to I have to basically either um, degrade the level of digital layer to make it believable or work so hard to make my film layer as sharp and beautiful as the digital one to bring them together. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> You're putting them side by side. The eye just picks up on the tiniest little thing and says, aha, this is not real. So it's really that sort of um, subtlety that you have to cover. And So try not to work with film. Yeah. Well, what do you think? You can unscreen share for a second. I want to ask you another probing question. Okay. Uh, so you know, you, you, yes, I see you now. So you know, you obviously made a huge uh, transition from film to digital. But there's a lot of people that uh, that very reluctantly move into digital, if at all, or they fight all the way, or they, you know, they might pay a little bit of heed to Photoshop or Lightroom, but they don't really get into it and embrace it. Um, why do you think it was so easy for you? Um, I had been, in the, in the beginning stages of my career, I'd been building scenes that I would shoot on film and um, working in the dark room to manipulate them. So lots of dodging and burning and lots of cutting up images and reshooting them and sanding the edges to make these um, seamless scenes. So I was always comfortable with manipulation. Um, and I've, I've always loved just, you know, purist photography as well, but I, I think that they're two different art forms and that they can, for, they can inform each other, but they're, they're, they're not, um, they shouldn't, neither should frighten each other. So, um, yeah, I mean, I moved into Photoshop. I was absolutely obsessed about getting to know Photoshop, and that was about the year uh, 2000, the end of the 90s. And I right. just wanted to completely embrace everything that there was about Photoshop because it was an opportunity to to build these amazing sets, but to actually have things like that background that I couldn't, I mean, obviously I can't go to Dijon and take a model and set up this elaborate scene because I'm not a trillionaire, so, or Annie Leibovitz, you know. Um, so really, for me, it was this amazing opportunity to create these fantasies that I, were, I was imagining. So that's never been something that frightened me. Um, and I think when people talk about um, you know, Photoshop being a false thing or it's, a, um, it's the devil's tool, um, it's, it seems to be fear. I mean, I don't think that everybody should use Photoshop. It's not for everybody, but it's certainly appropriate to what I do. Um, so, yeah, I just, I don't know why. I, I have a lot of students, you know, I go and do these talks at schools and things, and my experience has been that when somebody is really anti-Photoshop, when I really get down to what they're afraid of or what, what the problem is, is that it's so overwhelming having to learn social media, um, Photoshop, digital cameras in themselves are a hard thing to manipulate. If you, it's all learning and that can be frightening. So that's, I think it's yeah. a bit of fear. Yeah, I think sometimes it's it's fear. I think a lot of times it's mixed with a little bit of brainwashing from teachers that yeah. really don't like uh, any you know, digital or processing. Yeah, I, the thing is, I've, I mean, kids that are coming through school now, I think it's really sad that they don't have wet labs to go and print their own photos in. And I certainly, um, you know, I would work until midnight in the in the uni lab printing my own photos because there was this, amazing pleasure to be had from that man manipulative stage in the dark room. Um, and I, and the, the kids don't know that the tools in Photoshop are purely reflective of the tools that we all used with our hands beforehand. And so I'm, I feel very privileged that I've learnt the traditional aspect and now I embrace the digital aspect. Um, so I, yeah, I, I kind of feel it's sort of sad this gap between the two worlds, and they should they should unite. <laughs> I love the gap. I like the conflict. It defines me. Um, <laughs> well, 
Uh, what about, uh, uh, you must get all kinds of offers from different um, clients that want to hire you. What's your attitude? What Will you do some client work and or do you turn some down? And uh, you know, Because I think you're probably in a very uh, enviable position. A lot of photographers would like to be where you're at. So t tell me a little bit about where you are there. Um, I, look at the, I would love to get even like way more opportunities um, to work commercially with different clients. Um, you know, bigger, more money during ones. <laughs> but I, um, I, to be honest, I, I do turn down a lot of things because it's important that I do work that is, you know, true to true to my style as an artist. But I think, uh, I don't know. Like I, I tend to only get asked to do things. Well, 90% of the time I'm asked to do things that are appropriate to what I do as an artist. And that, I do see that as a, that is a great privilege. I can see that a lot of people would find that to be a great, a great position to be in. Um, but it doesn't always pay the bills, you know. Um, a lot of the time in the arts, um, for instance, I'm working, um, I'm working with the ballet this year in Australia. And I don't think the arts tend to have a lot of money in the first place. But the images that I will produce out of that will, they have the potential of winning awards and um, they define my portfolio as far as my commercial um, work is concerned. So, yeah, so I, I, I love to jump between the two. I, I love to work as a soloist and work on my fine art pieces alone. But I also really love working with teams of people who teach me amazing things and make me think in a different way. So this one that I'm showing on my screen, was this for uh, just an individual or was it a commercial shoot? Well, that, well, you can't see the two screens that I can see, but that is actually um, a beauty shot that I did at the Marie Antoinette shoot. She is the Marie Antoinette model on the same sofa. Oh. Yeah. Oh, wow. It came out great. Did you, those pearls, are those, are those in post or are those? No, no, no. They're stuck on. Yeah. That, that's, that's super glue. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, you know, when we build um, these scenes, a lot of those little, fit, those little details, I go and find the right size, size pearls and turn up and, and we work on them with the makeup artist. It seems like you have a lot of uh, uh, clients asking you to do different things. Are there any clients that you would, uh, like, really, do you have, like, a dream client that you'd like to get? Maybe we can, uh, maybe we can reach them through this podcast. Oh, uh, uh, look, I guess, um, you know, working with some of the really amazing fashion labels, like, um, like, a Alexander McQueen or something like that, where you're just given the opportunity to work with these incredible sculptural clothes, that's very yeah. cool. I would also very happily shoot for Coca-Cola <laughs> because, you know, because it's an opportunity. The budgets are there and then you can produce something that's really quite incredible and or Lavazza. Imagine doing a Lavazza calendar where they come along and they say, here's the money to produce these incredible sets. Like, what an opportunity. They haven't called me yet. Why haven't you called me? <laughs> Well, maybe they will soon. Uh, we'll do our best. Yeah, you know, thank you. I don't know much about. I don't do any any client work at all. That's not my my thing. Um, yeah. But uh, of course, there's nothing not, not a thing wrong with it. I'm interested in it. Do you do you find that a lot of these big uh, companies that do a lot of professional commercial photography, do you find that they don't branch out very often and go to independent creative artists like you that they more go to the, like their, their go-to people or their staff that have been around for five or ten years? Yeah, I mean, in Australia, it's usually your go-to guy, you know, where yeah. we, there's a massive emphasis on men in the industry. Um, um, I don't think most men in that position do carry their gear, so if it's an issue of, like, muscle, that's okay. Right. You can still hire me. Um, and they and they do. There is this. Um, I think if they're putting a lot of money into something and their necks are on the line for the job, they're going to instinctually go with somebody that they feel safe with. And um, I think that going with an artist, there's often this attitude that artists don't deliver on time. You know, we live with our heads in the clouds, and um, we're a gamble. Often it's the gamble that really catapults you in your life and your career. So some people then say, 
stuff it, I'm going to take a chance. And ultimately with me, they always say, my God, you actually delivered before the deadline or you're so reliable or, you know, but I do see, you know, I look around at friends and think, how do you keep getting phone calls, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, for me it's been um, building up that, um, that belief that I'm completely reliable, that um, I'm very professional about how I work and earning people's trust. And then, you know, I'm finally getting to a point where people just trust me because the portfolio speaks for itself. You know, answering all those emails, they always keep coming in very quickly. Um, and then, yeah, and then hopefully I become the go-to guy for certain, certain jobs. Yeah, well, I think it's inevitable. I think uh, pretty soon you're going to have uh, more work than you know what to do with and you can just start awesome. amping up your rates and saying no all the time. <laughs> that would be lovely. All right, cool. When, when are you coming back to New Zealand? Oh, I really should. Maybe we'll go snowboarding this year. Do you snowboard? Yeah, well, I know a good, uh, I know a good snowboarding place. It's about, about uh, 10 minutes from me. Oh, really? Well, we, you know, we're, yes. we're pretty keen to come over. And also, I really want to shoot some deer. Not, not with a gun, obviously. I'm not going <laughs> <laughs> um, for for a, um, a fine art series that I'm working on. So, you know, New Zealand is amazing to shoot in and um, so we'll try to line something up. If you're going to stick around, are you going to stick around? Yeah, I'm li I live here uh, permanently now, so right. yes. yes. Well, did you, fact, did you move there to shoot? Is that what? Yes, uh, primarily. You know, I love, I love landscapes and yeah. uh, it's got so beautiful landscapes here. It's um, almost like cheating. So, yeah, that's a big reason that I moved here with the family. Very cool. Yeah. And then Australia, are you coming over? Yeah, it's very close. I have no excuse, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like $300 to get here or something. Very small. Yeah, I can pop over there very cheap and we can, uh, I want to do some photo walks there and there's so many places to see in uh, yeah. Australia. I, I can't wait. I, I, get, I hear from a lot of nice people over there. I want to, want to make We're that We're the happen. best. We're the nicest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys really are. Um, well, cool. this, there, are there are a few assholes here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't deal with them, do we? No, there, no, no. There's a few of those in every country. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. I loved, uh, you know, seeing your stuff and finding out more about you. This app is awesome. I hope you make a lot more. I hope we can help uh, sell some of these things for you. And you. Uh, I'm really excited to see what's coming next. Do you have anything you can talk about? Any projects that you're working on that you can uh, that you can tell I'm us really a little bit about? I'm really secretive. I'm very secretive about what I'm doing. Good. Only because um, for a long time I really shared what I was working on, and and um, then there's this sort of expectation and. Um, so I'm kind of being pretty, I mean, you know, I went to the States last year and I shot in Yosemite and, um, yes. you know, it's got these magnificent landscapes and, and I've got some that I've retouched and they're ready to go for the series that I want to shoot deer for. Right. So, so that's kind of um, on the back burner, waiting for when I start getting the stock to put into the scene. Um, and then I'm doing, I'm doing a series at the moment that I'm producing these props for that's really different to the historical series because I get all these emails all day, every day from people saying, I think you should do a series of, you know, Aztec kings and, and um, you should do the Zulus and the... <laughs> so, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not actually just a historical photographer, so I'm doing something <laughs> that's highly, highly contemporary and um, studio-based, and I will share them with you soon. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, we can't wait to see. Do you have a, uh, you have a Google Plus discovery you want to share I do. with us? I do. With Here we go. So, I, I, a lot of the people I really, really love, I couldn't find on Google Plus because not enough people are sharing their work there. Um, so, I've been hounding people to get on there. Um, but in the meantime, I did find somebody that I thought was really interesting. I'll uh, bring her up now. She's American. Um, select. 
Sasha window. Um, where is she? Can you see her? Yes. So I'll start. It's pretty small. It's a bit oh, pixelated. Oh, you know her? She was on last week. Yes. Oh, no. She was our guest last week. Because she's got like 200 people <laughs> or something, so I thought I'll really give her this. <laughs> Let's <laughs> grab her. <laughs> what do we think alike? Yeah, yeah, she's wonderful. Well, what, what sort of led me to her was um, this girl I know, uh, Emma Hack, and she lives in Adelaide in Australia, and she... Um, I'll click to another image. She uh, did the Gautier... Do you know the Somebody That I Used To Know? You know that song? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Well, you know the film clip with he's painted and he's in the scene? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she did the, all that painting, and she, she shoots oh. people... Um, in these backgrounds where they're, they're like the wallpaper. Anyway, she's very cool and she's a friend of mine. And she told me about this girl and I thought I'd made a discovery, but clearly I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll, you'll have to watch last week's show because uh, we asked many probing questions of her too and she showed some of her latest work that she just did uh, ah. by some uh, famous museum in New York. I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I know of a project she's about to do just secretly, uh, that she might have talked about it. Did she talk about a project coming up? That, no, um, she was tight-lipped as you are about your... Yeah, your, well, I'm not going to... I don't know her, but I know her secret, but I won't tell it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she's about cool. to be catapulted anyway, so she'll have, you know, thousands of followers soon. Good. I'm going to get rid of her now because, you know, <laughs> you've discovered her. <laughs> No, it's okay. We always do rediscoveries on here because yes. right. sometimes people miss an episode or two. I don't expect people to watch all 41 episodes. <laughs> right here. Cool. Well. Um, cool. Thank you. I'll share one here too. Uh, this is also sort of a, a rediscovery. This guy's wonderful. Um, beep, 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 beep. Screen share here. This guy's name is uh, Peter Frum. From perhaps. Oh, cool. Um, he does really cool work. He just released this one. Um, I think it's really cool. Um, he's very inspirational things he does. Um, he has really good ideas. He's very conceptual. Um, he does so much cool stuff. Beautiful. Yeah, I love his yeah. stuff. Are they all balloons? The whole series. Uh, this might be one of his. Uh, um, you're you're in the in the air album. So that's a, yeah. yeah, this is one of his special albums. But, yeah. Yeah, you can go through almost any of his albums, and you'll see interesting ideas. Let's go pick a different one here. Let's go pick uh, him. Where's he from? Um, Somewhere in Europe, I think. He's oh. from Katrine Holm, wherever that is. I don't know. No. Yeah, let's see here. Let's open up all of his albums here. I can't go wrong, no matter which one I click on. Let's pick... Um, hmm. Let's go look at... Oh, my gosh. Is he, like, even in sunrises and sunsets, he's got 209 photos. He's in wow. Sweden, by the way. Sweden is a... Uh -huh. I mean, so I don't even have to zoom in on any of these. You can just tell they're awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got in touch with him? It's great. Anyway, um, we're, you know, we're sort of uh, internet acquaintances. Um, yeah. But uh, he knows that I admire his work, and I, I mention it from time to time, and I go comment on a lot of his work, so... He's really, really cool. That's beautiful. Very nice feel to his work. Look at that. Yeah. Redonkulous. Yeah, amazing. Redonkulous. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I guess that about covers it. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug or mention before you leave? Um, yeah, uh, do, I, do I show... Um, go to my website. Um, there's plenty there. And then you can find my social media you know, click on my little birdies and things and come and find me there as well. And if you ask me something, I'll answer you through social media. And 
<laughs> you don't all send me heaps of emails asking me 20 questions, but um, yeah, I just, you know, nothing really. Just thank you so much for talking and anyone who was listening, thank you for listening. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you, Dave. And thank you, Brian, over at Twit. Um, thanks for stepping in for Tony. Um, he's over in Japan right now with his uh, girlfriend. Maybe that was a secret. But anyway, <laughs> Tony's away. We don't know where he is. <laughs> his wife doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I think Tony will be back in a week or two for, uh, for Twit. Anyway, thank you, Brian. And thank you, Dave, for helping me set this up. As soon as this show ends, we've got to get together our act for uh, the next coming weeks, see what, who's coming up. I know we have uh, one of the big wigs from Adobe and Lightroom joining us and, and all kinds of fun stuff coming up with, with all sorts of people. Basically, if it's, if it's interesting to me, I hope it's interesting to you too. That's sort of the, the vainglorious, selfish nature of the show. And I thank everyone for watching and your support and questions and everything. And so I, I'm glad you guys got to know Alexia. Um, Stay in touch with her because she's she's always showing interesting things to the world and sharing her creativity. I think that's that's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Wait. Now comes the, the yeah. What? Go. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. Wait, are we giving away? Ah, uh, yes. Away? Well, you you can uh, just jump onto uh, you know the various streams and you can randomly award a winner okay. right after. Okay. I'll cool. leave that up to you. To randomly choose. Okay. <laughs> all right. Very awesome. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Now comes the part of the show where we all just kind of wave goodbye from our little boxes. Okay. Bye. Bye, Alexia. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.